Fox Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday, and we're going to talk about District 8. We saw a pretty uh, rough and tumble special election in District 8. And in case you don't know, this is the suburbs north and west of Phoenix in Maricopa County, New River, Peoria, Sun City, Litchfield Park. Surprise. The winner in the special election was Debbie Lesko, Congresswoman Debbie Lesko. She's our guest on Newsmaker Sunday, along with her challenger for a second time, Democrat Harold Tipperini. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you Let me say us. at the outset, um, in, a, in an election cycle where we have had some people not necessarily want to do this, I applaud you both for coming on together and doing it. Absolutely. And I think the public served well that you do. Yeah. So it's thank important you. important for the voters. I, I, I totally agree. Uh, Congresswoman, let's start with you. Sure. Biggest issue in District 8, in your view? There's a number of big issues. Of course, the economy is always on the top, not, no matter if it's in District 8 or the entire nation. And I'm really supportive of what the Republicans have done with the Tax Cuts and Job, Jobs Act. It's really boosted the economy. In fact, I just voted to make permanent the individual tax cuts, which will help, obviously, individuals of all uh, economic status, but also small businesses. So that's, a, that's a big issue. Economy, big, biggest issue in District 8, in your view? Um, I would say it's one of the three. I think the top three are really health care, um, education, and economy. And when I say health care, that also includes Medicare and Social Security, because we have such a large percentage of our uh, electorate of our community members are retirees that are counting on their Medicare and Social Security. So I think it's interesting that Congresswoman Lesko uh, is proud of the tax cut because as we know, that tax cut has now set them up, um, according to Speaker Ryan, for some very deep cuts in the Medicare and Social Security and Medicaid, which is very essential, not just to our elderly You population. would have voted no. I would have voted no, of you course. You would have voted no. Yeah. It was fiscally irresponsible, John, um, at a time of growth to have a huge transfer of wealth to our largest corporations and our most wealthy Americans, rather than focusing on middle class Americans, working class small businesses, those retirees. And Those you disagree with that. Focus on. You, you oh, think her that, talking points are totally false. But you believe the yeah, tax they're, cuts they're have, have, have not affected yeah. not just the wealthy or millionaires and billionaires. Oh, yeah. And, and that rhetoric from the Democrats, they say that nationwide. We're not going to cut Medicare or Social Security. In fact, I introduced a piece of legislation to protect Social Security and Medicare. And we can see it every day. I've toured the district. I've gone to businesses. I've talked to people. I've gone to schools. Um, small businesses are really like these tax cuts. They've passed on the savings onto their employees for wage increases, have hired more workers. <coughs> the average person, the average family, I should say, in CD8, Congressional District 8, will save between 1200 if they're single, or $2,600 a year in tax savings. Do you quarrel this with those numbers? This is for common people. What I'm saying is, how about the priorities? How about the fact that that compares to $12 billion for a company like Walmart or Apple or ExxonMobil? And let's remember that this idea of trickle-down economics, I mean, the corporations themselves have said that the money is not coming down to their workers, that wages have not gone up consistently. And out of the 500 companies in Standard & Poor, 500, um, only 49 of them have actually given bonuses. They haven't raised wages, John. They've just given bonuses. That means it's a finite amount of money. Uh, and, and let's be clear, you know, you talk about the stock market and things like that. 52% of Americans don't own stock. And what the, what the corporations did with their big tax cuts, and they said this. They took their money, they went back, and they uh, bought back their stock. Their portfolios are artificially inflated, and their shareholders make a profit. It does not impact the How workers. How do you explain what, what seems to be um, an unprecedented, in recent years, economy, economic boom? Do you think that that's by accident that that happened? Well, look, it's been going on for many years. It certainly didn't start with this current administration. It was on an upward trajectory for many years. Unemployment has been coming down, and economic growth has been going up. Um, so that's not something that certainly the current administration uh, can take responsibility let's, let's, for. Let's talk about, so you mentioned Social Security. Um, is Social Security absolutely untouchable? And I'm not talking about for current retirees. But if you said for new workers coming into the queue, mm -hmm. We're going to raise, you're going to have to work a year or two longer to collect it. Would that be workable to you or you? Uh, so I don't think that we should raise the retirement rate. Because that uh, fixes the actuary tables. It just well, suddenly magically gets better. 
Right, and we want to make sure it's solvent for years to come. We don't want it just to be solvent for the people receiving it now. We want it to be solvent for decades. We want it for our children and our grandchildren, absolutely. But the way to do that, I don't, I don't, I'm not a proponent of raising the retirement age. I think it's important to consider uh, whether we increase a payroll tax, or, uh, the, the Social Security uh, payroll tax, or if we raise the cap on the uh, amount of income that can be taxed. Because what we know is because wages have stayed low for over 40 years now, there is less and less revenue coming in to our Social Security trust fund. And there aren't as many workers and there's more exactly. retirees. I take it you're exactly. going to disagree with that Well, that you can approach. see that there's a clear difference between us. Um, she's supporting more taxes, tax increase, that's her answer. I'm supporting protecting Social Security, Debbie. And so I introduced legislation that basically says the U.S. House of Representatives wants to protect Social Security and Medicare for those relying on it and protect it for future generations. How would you now, do this it? Is, this is a very complicated um, situation, and so I'd probably approach it the same way that I did pension reform in the, in the Senate and the House, and that's where you have to when work you were a state together. Lawmaker. Yeah, when yeah. I was a state lawmaker. You have to work with both Republicans and Democrats on something this major and this important. But there seems to be no agreement here. Well, you Can know. Can you raise the, the age of eligibility? This is something that, that we have to work on um, together as both Republicans and Democrats. Would you support and it? People didn't think, support what? Raising, raising the, the age. I cannot For answer. For new workers, I'm I not talking about answer, I cannot answer what I'd specifically do because the way that I operate is I usually work, and it took me a year and a half on pension reform, and I talk to all the stakeholders involved, and that's how you can come up with consensus when you talk to both Republicans and Democrats. But this is so important. We have to protect it for our senior citizens. We can't change anything for the people that are relying on it now or the people that are close to retirement age. But we do have to be realistic that we need to protect it for future generations, and it's having financial problems. So we have to work together and be realistic and get it done. I did that in the state legislature. I believe I can do it in the U.S. Final Congress. word on this, and then we'll yeah. move on. No, so, um, yeah. so a couple things. I think you have to have ideas of how you're going to execute something. You can't just sort of shoot out talking points. And it's a little disingenuous when you supported a tax bill, which I know she wasn't in the House at the time, but she said she would have voted for the tax cut that happened last December that now puts... But you did vote for extending the tax cuts. Sure, the individual tax cut to make it permanent. Right. Most right. definitely. But, but my point is this, is that... Um, she wants to protect it for today. My, my goal is to protect it long term and make it permanently. We want to protect it for generations I want to, protect to come. It for both. And the bill is just about stating it. It's not about a plan to do so. But more importantly, her statement of wanting to work on a bipartisan basis, I think, is disingenuous, John, because the first thing she did after she was elected is she joined the Freedom Caucus, which is the far right faction of the GOP, which tends to obstruct even moderate legislation within their own party. It is not representative of anybody who wants to work on a bipartisan basis. Let me ask you, sure, is I, this... Can I talk about that a little bit? Quickly, and then we're going to yeah. move on. So every Republican member, except Martha McSally, because she was from Tucson, is a member of the Freedom Caucus. And if you look at my votes, I, I'm a conservative. Uh, but I also am an individual, so I don't always vote with the Freedom Caucus. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Well, I know that she voted with the Freedom Caucus recently when a bill came up to uh, offer specific counseling guidance for veterans to obtain student loans, and the Freedom Caucus were the members that voted against it. Okay, oh, that's, let, let's that's talk totally about. False. I want to talk a little that bit. That's totally false. Let me talk that's about factual. Luke Air Force Base mm -hmm. for a minute. Yeah. Um, we've got the F-35 out there. Absolutely. It is a very expensive platform. Now, Luke is mm -hmm. no doubt a driver in the West Valley. It is a huge economic engine. It's been there since 1941. It's an integral part of your district. Mm -hmm. But the facts are, this, this <coughs> F-35, each one of them costs about $100 million per plane. The whole program is $1.5 trillion. Mm -hmm. Is that too much, Harold Tippernini? Look, we're so proud to have Luke Air Force Base in our district. We could not be prouder of, uh, of supporting its mission. And, and, you know, you point out the F-35 program. S you know, 67% of uh, F-35 pilots across the, or around the world are at, are, right. are at Luke. 
um, and we're very proud of the mission, and we would, would want to do everything that we can to protect the mission. Uh, and we have to remember the economic boost that Luke also provides. It's a $2.4 billion economic it's boost. Pretty bullish on so Luke. So we have to make sure we're protecting their mission. We have to be smart about it, but it's something that we have to work very hard to protect and support uh, because it's not only about Luke and the active airmen, but it's also about um, uh, supporting the families that are helping to ensure this mission and making sure they have the resources they have, there, as well as our veterans once they come out. Congresswoman Lesko, this, this has been an issue because some have really taken the F-35 to task and said you're asking too much from one airplane to do too many things. And what you've been left with is an aircraft maybe that isn't great at anything because of that. I'm a huge supporter of Luke Air Force Base. I just uh, toured there. I met with the Secretary of the Air Force, Heather Wilson. I met with the commander. I talked to the different uh, men and women who um, are out there, and fl one of them that flies the F-35. This is a good plane. Um, in fact, I just voted for increased funding for the military, which includes a pay raise for the troops, the largest in nine years, but also 93 more F-35s. Uh, I believe they're you're, a good plane. You're bullish also on this I'm airplane. bullish. <laughs> I'm bullish for Luke Air Force Base. I'm also bullish for veterans. I just voted for a VA Mission Act bill, which really helps the veterans, does reform for their health care. I'm Luke, totally behind Luke. Just a the yes from both of you, or a yes or no. Mm -hmm. Is Luke safe in the West Valley? Is it now, because of the F 35, pretty much untouchable? Yes. I think we'll protect it, absolutely. Well protected. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here on Newsmaker Saturday. If I say Sunday, you guys feel free to correct <laughs> me because old habits die hard. When we come back, the Kavanaugh Supreme Court nomination, we're going to talk about that. Both, both the candidates in District 8 uh, differ very drastically on how that was handled and whether he was the right guy for the high court. We're going to talk about that and how it may affect this race in District 8 as we return with Hero Tipperini, the Democrat, and Congresswoman Debbie Lesko. Back in a moment on Newsmaker Saturday. Back on Newsmaker Saturday, and uh, we've got the two candidates for District 8 for Congress, and we want to show you, this is Hero Tipperini on your right and Congressman Debbie Lesko on the left of your screen. Let's put up a still of District 8. Um, it's kind of crude, but, but if you look at it, it's the suburbs north and west of Phoenix in Maricopa County. New River, Peoria, Sun City, Litchfield Park, Surprise. We also have Anthem. Anthem's in there. Mm -hmm. Hero, what, what is it that people, the first thing out of their mouth when you do a town hall, they want to talk about what? Healthcare. 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 Because their premiums are going up, John. We have a very limited number of uh, providers in our marketplace in Arizona. Premiums are going up because of a lot of the things that our current uh, House and Senate and administration have done. They have removed the individual mandate. They're threatening to remove protections for pre-existing conditions. They're selling short-term junk plans. Um, they're threatening to uh, have, uh, if they continue to erode the ACA, the progress that we did made, we won't have children being able to stay on their our families. Average age in the 26. district is a little bit older in District 8, And right? they worry about their Medicare, okay. which so, is health care. Um, Debbie Lesko, when you do a town hall, what's the first thing? You know, it depends on which group of people is there. Illegal immigration is still very important in Congressional District Do 8. people want a wall, a physical yes. barrier? Yes, the vast majority of people want a physical barrier wall. They want to secure the border. I was just down at the border yesterday at the Nogales uh, Port of Entries. Now, that's and, a fortified yeah. section of the border yeah. in Nogales. I mean, that is a serious wall. Except when you get right outside of Nogales, right. there's a three-strand barbed down. wire yes. with some wood stakes. I mean, we really need to secure the border. The cartel there is taking advantage of people. The cartel wants to make money. So whether it's with drugs or whether it's with human smuggling, they are abusing these people, raping women, putting uh, you know drugs over. We need to stop. What do you this. do about all of this Central American asylum claim this that, that's is going a major, on? This We've is seen a, major a huge problem. number. This, I just this month. talked to Border Patrol about this Customs and Border Patrol yesterday. They said about 200 people showed up just the other day, just I think west of Nogales. And they just cross the border. They call 911. They're being coached by the cartel and exactly what to do. They have there's, kids in tow there's off. There's such off, an off. overflow of people that they give put on those ankle bracelets. They cut off the ankle bracelets. The cartel is telling them 
all what to do, and it's all for money. Harold, um, you you immigrated here right. with your family from India when from you were India. three years old. I was three, yes. Three years yeah. old. Does this change your opinion about this issue? Does it shape it well, in a different way? I mean, way? look, obviously we're a country built on immigrants, uh, but that's not just my opinion. That's the opinion. But your of family came here the, legally. You went through course, the process. Of course, of course. And I'll tell you what, John. So I've had the the opportunity to go down to the border as well. I went down and spoke with Sheriff Estrada. Went around Nogales, saw the the. The fencing there, spoke with Border Patrol agents, spoke with officers at the ports of entry. Mm -hmm. And what we asked them, how can we make sure at a federal level we help you do your job the best you can? And what they said across the board is that they're understaffed. They need more staffing, they need more boots on the ground, they need more actual officers and uh, deputies to help man you prefer the, the, that the over fencing. A wall. They, they said across the board, none of them said a wall would help them. And this is why, because they said they need more surveillance equipment, more technology, uh, more drones, more uh, drug sniffing dogs, more x ray equipment. Uh, now, obviously, I mean, we want secure borders, absolutely. So if there's areas of weakness, we should reinforce those, no doubt. But we have to be sensible about what we're doing. And we know that uh, border crossings are down from 2010. How much compassion do you have for these Central Americans seeking asylum right now? Well, look, we have to consider the fact that when a, a mother goes for hundreds of miles with her child, um, she's not doing it because she wants to. She's doing it because she's escaping a, a, a threatening existence back home. So we have to consider um, those things. And do look, we have an a humane policy does not mean it's a lawless policy. Do we have an obligation to accommodate these people? I think we need smart, compassionate uh, immigration reform. We know that. This has been a can that's kicked down the road for way too long. Let me move on to uh, Judge Kavanaugh. His confirmation, I, I mean, we've rarely seen anything like it in Washington. Uh, the rancor, the ugliness. Debbie Lesko, let me, let me start with you. Um, sure. Was he the right man for this job? Yes, he is the right man for this job. Um, you know, as you may know, I'm a survivor of domestic abuse from an ex-husband 25 years ago. And since then, I've been helping at the state level and now at the congressional level. I'm the uh, bi bipartisan co-chairman of a group to defend and stop domestic violence. Did you believe so, Christine Ford when she testified? You know, I think that it was great that the Senate um, allowed her to testify in whatever manner she wanted, whether it was private or, or public. Obviously, it was public. And I'm glad that Judge Kavanaugh had an opportunity to do that as well. The, um, and I think it was good, if you look back, that uh, Senator Flake asked for another federal investigation because then it was classified and all the senators got to see it, but there was no corroborating ev evidence. So I believe people are innocent until proven Should guilty. Should the public see that FBI finding? You know, I don't know. Uh, it's classified in the Senate uh, voted on Is it on possible us. they classified mm -hmm. it to protect her? It's possible. That's the thing that really disturbed me is that somebody on the Democrat side has really politicized this. She wanted to remain anonymous, and somehow this got leaked. And, you know, Dianne Feinstein had this since July. She could have done an FBI investigation or asked for one way back then. This was all political. Go ahead. Yeah, what what no. was your take on this whole yeah, I, sad spectacle? Well, look, I, I was opposed to his um, nomination prior to the allegations coming Why? out. Because he has very expansive views of presidential powers, which are, are, are rare to the that level he, that he to could the level be that asked to them. adjudicate right. at some point. Exactly. His views on not necessarily seeing Roe v. Wade as settled law, his lack of transparency of the time that he was in the Bush administration, none of those documents were out. It was less than 10% of all those documents that were revealed. And we're talking about a lifetime appointment, John, to the highest court in the land. And then on top of it, when he gave his uh, testimony after Dr. Ford, and this was uh, uh, confirmed as well um, by the American Bar Association, he showed a sharp tone of partisanship. He showed a level of impropriety that's not been seen before. He showed that he doesn't have an even killed temperament. Uh, all those things should be disqualifying for a Supreme Court justice. There's been talk in the House of, by Democrats, uh, Nadler being the chief one, that there might be a move in the U.S. House of Representatives if Democrats got control to possibly try to impeach uh, Justice Kavanaugh. Is that something you would favor? Well, I believe that if you are appointed to the highest court of the land, that you should be 
um, that your your character, your ability to be nonpartisan, your temperament, um, all those things that are part of the ABA code, those should be maintained. They should be beyond reproach. And that, that was not reflected in, in Judge Kavanaugh. So if the House, if you were in a majority um, and they went down that road, you would think that's okay? I would say that, look, there are a lot of things that we need to attend to right away. This I mean, would not be high on your there list. There are a lot of fires to be put out. I would say I would... It has longstanding consequences, John. You're you, talking about uh, impacting civil rights. You're talking about voting rights. You're talking mm -hmm. about women's reproductive health rights. You're talking about presidential powers. It has wide-reaching consequences. Congresswoman Lesko, your sounds, take on that. It sounds like my opponent would vote to impeach from what she's I would she's vote saying. for full transparency. And so, and so um, the thing is, this is how radical the Democrats have gotten. Um, they're calling for abolishing ICE. They're calling for impeaching Kavanaugh. The, the Democrats of years ago have really changed. They're calling for socialism. They don't like capitalism. They want open borders. They're allowing illegals to vote in San Francisco. She supported in a letter that she signed on to free health care for illegals. Nope. This is, you know, this is radical. We've got to take a quick break. We're going to well, come back. I'm going to need to address a lot of that, John. Okay, we okay. will do that when we come back on lies. Newsmaker Saturday. Back in a moment. Back on Newsmaker Saturday, uh, right when we left, the Congresswoman Lesko, you had, you had said that the Democratic Party is just swinging wildly to the left. Well, you'd like to respond. Yeah, quickly. absolutely, John. I mean, she just threw out a litany of things that are false and that cannot be attributed to me or my campaign at any point. Um, I, I have never called for abolishing ICE. I have always spoken of wanting secure borders. Um, my health care plan, uh, contrary to the lies that... Uh, Ms. Lesko has been putting out there um, is actually a fiscally responsible plan that involves using Medicare as a buy-in, meaning that people purchase Medicare. Um, it allows the free market to work and actually drives down costs and enhances competition. So we get to that goal of quality, affordable health care for all. So she has misconstrued and falsely led people to think uh, all these things. That is not what I have said, and I have corrected her repeatedly. Okay, quickly, Elaine, can I ask you? Mm -hmm. You are a real doctor. I am a real physician, John. <laughs> oh, how I am did this a, all okay. start? Oh, I am a, I need I am okay. a 20 year, mm -hmm. over 20 years, mm -hmm. I've been a licensed physician to practice medicine in Arizona. And that okay. is an End absolute of story. fact. Period. Go ahead. Hero, I feel, is being very deceptive to the voters. And this was ABC 15 News that brought this up. Oh, she do you hasn't have to bring them up? <laughs> she hasn't practiced medicine for over a decade. Yet, this is central to her campaign. She's in scrubs. She's working on patients. This is all pretend. This is fake. Debbie, it's not She's pretend. faking the voters. She's but once deceiving a doctor, the voters. She's a doctor, right? Exactly, she doesn't John. put. Thank you. She can't go in right now and go work on doctors I and actually, work I on patients. Could. I actually could. Um, I'm a licensed physician. Okay, we've Debbie. got a minute left, yes. so we're going to do close. And she could. has. Give me your best yes. pitch I... for why you should be reelected. You elected in the special sure. election. Why should voters give you their confidence? I believe people should vote for me because I'm the best fit for the district. I'm a pragmatic conservative. Our district is conservative. I also have a proven track record of working with both Republicans and Democrats, taking on hard issues, getting them done. I also have a proven track record of helping my constituents. When I was in the state legislature, I did a bunch of legislation to directly help my constituents. I also do it in Congress. I have set up an office to help people with Medicare, VA issues, Social Security issues, and we even have mobile offices. Okay, 30 seconds, you get the final word because you got the first word. Thank, uh, thank you, John. You thank you again for having You're us. You're welcome. And look, uh, what we know for sure is that Washington is broken. Um, politicians like uh, my opponent here are more focused on sowing divisiveness and partisanship than actually serving the issues and the needs of our constituents. Uh, they're more tied to their special interests and their largest donors. Look, my skills are about listening to people. It's about following the facts, working on a nonpartisan team, diagnosing an issue, and implementing a real-life solution. I did that in the ER. I do that in cancer research advocacy. I do that as a member of the Maricopa Health Foundation Board, and that's what I'll do for the families of the 8th District. Thank you, Hero Tipranini. Congresswoman Lesko, best of luck. Uh, early voting's already started, and we will see you next week on Newsmaker Saturday. I don't think I said Sunday one time. See you next week. <laughs> Thank you. Great.